Talent. Hello, podcast lovers everywhere. This is Richie Phillips, and this is my podcast. It is called Top Talent. I think the title aptly explains what it's about. I'm looking for talent, trying to expose talent everywhere, although I do live in the Albany area of upstate New York. Uh, You know, it's called the Capital Region. So I do feature a lot of talented people from this particular part of the planet. But if you look at past episodes, I have ventured out once in a while. Also, people who are coming to the area who are famous, I feature them too. You can, of course, hear the past episodes by going to the Apple Podcast app, which is maybe how you got this in the first place. Or you can go wherever you get your podcasts. I also have a website. It's HireRichie.com. H-I-R-E-R-I-C-H-I-E.com. That's HireRichie.com. But this episode takes a little bit of a different tact. I'm going to open with a question. Do you have anybody in your family who is well-known or made a name for themselves with their talent? Just wondering, because this is kind of a personal episode on my part. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. There is somebody extremely famous, in fact, a famous family in my family, in my extended family. You may not know the name right off the bat, but I guarantee you're going to know some of the inventions and some of the incredible creations that this family is responsible for. I investigated this and I found someone who is a distant relative who runs a company called Fleischer Studios. I don't know if the name Fleischer rings a bell, but if you ever go back to an old Popeye cartoon and you see the beginning of it, it will say the name Max Fleischer or it may say the name directed by Dave Fleischer. That happens to be my and my brother's great uncle, because Max Fleischer was my father's uncle. And of course, that goes for the other brothers in the family, of which there were five and one sister. And the sister is named Ethel Fleischer, who married a man named Ben Phillips. Thus, we have Ethel and Ben Phillips, our grandparents. One of the remaining Fleischers around who I happened to find through a woman by the name of Ginny Mahoney on a Facebook group called Fleischer's Folio. Turns out she is the granddaughter of Max Fleischer, and she told me about another grandson of Max Fleischer, who happens to be Mark Fleischer, who happens to run Fleischer Studios in California. Are you writing all this down? Because there's going to be a quiz on it. So I found his name. I found his phone number through this woman, uh, Jim, Jenny Mahoney, and gave him a phone call. And he was really gracious and said he would love to do the podcast. And you're going to find out a fascinating history of animation with these true pioneers of animation. And some of the characters that they created. Uh, does the term boop boop doop ring a bell? Featuring questions in the podcast from my own family members. That and more with my conversation with my relative, Mr. Mark Fleischer. Top talent. Hello. Hi, Richie. How you doing? <laughs> How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. It's That's... a real privilege to be uh, on your on your show. Oh. And uh, wonderful to have reconnected with a uh, family member. Absolutely. Now, can you explain how you are related? Well, um, Max Fleischer was my grandfather. Amazing. And uh, I, I gather that uh, his uh, sister Ethel was your grandmother, correct? That is correct. And Ethel so had three kids. I'm, I'm, I'm not good at the genealogy, so right. it makes us second cousins once removed or something like that. I I'm not sure, but we're certainly related. We are definitely related. I think it is like a second cousin type of thing, and it's took us a long time. I, I think I looked it up. I think we're about the same age, as a matter of fact. You can't be that old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not going to divulge your age because it'll divulge mine. So <laughs> Thank, <right>. you. Thank <laughs> you. Okay, great. <laughs> now, just to uh, get you up to speed here on my end, I have a brother, Bill. So when I speak, I want to speak for him as well. And he has some kids. He has uh, three children, uh, Tyler, Matt, and Jessica. I want to mention them. And I have a son, Ben, who was named after... Ethel's husband, Ben, and the reason I'm mentioning them is that uh, they have some questions that they're going to be interspersing in this podcast, too, because they're so interested. Terrific. And just so that uh, we have um, a balanced yes. uh, view here. Yes, I want to ask uh, you. I have an bro- older, brother, older brother, Bruce, okay, uh, who has uh, three daughters and a younger sister, Jane, who has two sons, and uh, that's kind of who's who's around on our side. And then, of course, um, 
my father, Richard, who was Max's son, yes. uh, had a sister, Ruth. So there were, Max uh, had uh, two children, Ruth and, and Richard. And um, uh, that's Ruth's uh, children. Um, well, she had three children. And uh, Ginny is her daughter, who is uh, on the board of directors of Fleischer Studios. Right. And maybe give you a little background as to what Fleischer Studios looks like today. I'd love to know. Um, it's basically, at this point, we have 20 shareholders. Wow. Almost all of them are in some manner or form uh, related to Max. Uh, and uh, those are the people that own the shares of Fleischer Studios. There's a board of directors consisting of uh, five members uh, of, of, the, of the studio. It's a corporation. And that's the entity that owns the rights in uh, Betty Boop ah. and the uh, characters that are related to Betty Boop. Gotcha. That's, of course, one of the questions. And I'm, the, <laughs> I'm the president and chairman of the board. But, uh, I know there was a question about are uh, there other relatives who currently work for Fleischer Studios. That's really the um, the relationship. It's it's a shareholder relationship and a corporate governance relationship. Right. Uh, we don't have any active operations in terms of production or anything like that. We basically oversee the licensing uh, of the uh, Betty Boop uh, name likeness image and other activities like that related. To her. Yeah, that was my son's question. He wanted to know, is there anybody in the family in the creative arts? Right. right. That, that was what you were answering. That yeah. was done. So, I mean, they, right. they're, various family members do various things in the creative arts, for sure, although it's not related to Fleischer Studios. Itself. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. What would you say, as to starting out here, we've got to start at ground level zero and explain what they were really known for. Um, it's actually related to my brother Bill's question. What do you think their greatest contributions were? As animators, I see them as inventors just as much as animators. Uh, I, I agree with you. Uh, Max and his brothers, and, and and by the way, Max is Fleischer. There was a question about, I think the Jew had the little hook and eyelet. On yes. The, back of, uh, the dresses. That was actually uh, Max's father, William, who was a tailor. Okay. And he had clients who were uh, a lot of a lot of them were police officers because his shop was right near the police station, and they all complained to him that they couldn't polish the brass buttons without getting the polish on their uniforms and staining the uniforms. So he invented the police button that you could basically he just hooks in from the back. You could unhook it, take the button out, and polish it. Without um, ruining your uniform. <laughs> so he was an inventor as well. He was an inventor as well. And basically it was his tailor shop that is now located uh, where Madison Square Garden is. So that's another truth. Fleischer Studios was very nearby. Right. Almost 69 West 46th Street. And that's yeah. where, where, where the tailor shop is. There were 1,600 Broadways with Fleischer Studios. So going all the way back, let's start at the beginning here. I was thinking, you ever have a family, everybody has a family where the brother is a clown, and the parents are always saying, stop clown, <laughs> <laughs> stop clowning around, you're ruining the event, you're ruining our vacation, or whatever. If it wasn't for this one brother clowning around, I was thinking about this, I mean, he, he was really the beginning of an entire empire. Could you explain what I'm talking about? Sure. <laughs> um, what happened was that Max had an idea. At a very early age, he went to work for the Brooklyn Daily Eagle uh, because he basically he wanted to do uh, science and and drawings for them. He even offered to pay them uh, to work for them Jeez. in about 1900. And they ended up hiring him and, of course, paying him. And he moved on to popular science in around 1910. So as an illustrator, um, he was an illustrator for them, basically? He was, he was an illustrator and very interested in, in science and inventions. Uh -huh. And there was the, edit, the editor-in-chief, uh, Walden uh, Plemfit, I think, is, I don't really, Plemfit, I can't quite pronounce his name. He uh, complained about animation, how in those days it was so jerky right. that it was very, very hard to watch. And Max came up with 
what we do, you would think is a kind of a simple and, and obvious concept, but no one had ever actually really done it. You know, when you take a pad and you draw a figure and you have it like at each page, it moves a little bit. Sure. And then when you like flip the whole thing, you see some movement. Oh, sure. We all did that. He, exactly. And he came up with the idea of doing that with film uh, and invented a, a, a device that would do that. And he and his brother Dave worked for uh, about a year on this. And what it did is that uh, he bought an old boy uh, film projector, turned it into a camera, and did a test with Dave uh, because Dave had recently had a had a job as a as a clown. Right. Times, where they had a clown uniform around the house, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, their mother, Amelia, um, fitted Dave with the clown uniform, and they did a test with Dave kind of converting around in the top of their apartment building, and they filmed it. And it was uh, about 150 feet of film, which is about 2.7 uh, uh, seconds <laughs> of film, and or actually 2.7 minutes of film, um, and what they did is that they uh, filmed this and then they took the, uh, uh, the film and each frame they traced over, over the, the film itself, the image. The live action. The live action image. Mm -hmm. And then they took each of those tracings, which became known as cells, and not, not actually the, when they filmed, they took each of the tracings and individually filmed the cell. Or the, or the tracing, and they had to expose that by hand for exactly the right amount of time, uh, or it would be ruined. And so what they then did is that they had now on film uh, all of the individual movements uh, that they, they, they could take and, and basically draw and filled in all of the individual movements. And when they filmed that, they were now filming their artwork, and that became now the animation. So originally it was just the two of them doing it. They did all the drawings. This is way, yes. way before they had anybody working with them, right? Way before they had it. It was just the two of them. Just the two of them. Yes, and they spent a year doing it. Yeah. Uh, and basically they did it in uh, Max's uh, little apartment. And they finally, at the end of the day, had like, uh, you know, about two and a half minutes, or a little over two minutes of animation. They didn't know what they had. There was no way to actually look at it until the whole thing was put together, and each individual frame they had to expose like twenty uh, six hundred frames individually by hand of all of these drawings that right. were basically tracings of a film image. And one night they put up a sheet on the uh, wall, and they started the projector, and modern animation was born. And that's a famous clip. You can see that right on YouTube, right? Oh, right on your website. I've seen it right on your website, runfleischerstudios.com, right? Right. You have to see that, folks, if you haven't. It's fascinating. It really is. Then he connected with a movie chain, right? They were showing these clips, yes. these uh, short cartoons in the beginning of movies, and he was looking at them and, and noticed how jerky they were. Yes. And it, uh, he, well, he then he was hired by J.R. Bray, uh, and he started the Out of the Inkwell series, which right. was Coco the Clown. Again, uh, was inspired by that uh, uh, original clip or little piece and Fritz the Dog. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, he was sent to Fort Silger in World War I and <clears throat> created the first ever uh, Army training films. Well, I read that. Now, uh, when you say sent that, there, you mean he, was dra he went into the Army, is what you're saying? Or, yes. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Then he was discharged uh, from Fort Sill, and then Max and Dave uh, started Out of the Inkwell films and continued the Out of the Inkwell series. Uh, and then there were a few other things that came along. Um, the Song Cartoon series uh, was started. They created the, um, the Bouncing Ball, you know, Follow the Bouncing Ball. Of course. They created that. And in, I think, around 1925 or 26, um, they synchronized sound for the first time with the cartoon. Uh, it was just a little bit before uh, Disney's Steamboat Willie. And they used the bouncing ball uh, 
in sync to my old Kentucky home. <laughs> to that song. And was Dave yeah. Dave Fleischer, he was more in charge of the music? Was he more the, he was more the musical one, correct? No, nope. Dave ended up really being kind of uh the director. Oh. Um music was uh Lou Fleischer. Lou Fleischer. Okay. Yeah, we didn't name all the Fleischers. Yeah. How many so there was Dave, Lou, five brothers. It five was, brothers. It was Max, Dave, Charlie, who was very mechanical. Joe, who uh, was electrical, and then Lou, uh, who was music. And one sister. We, we, you know, this is the Me Too movement. And one you, sister. You can't forget my grandmother, right. <laughs> Ethel. <laughs> <laughs> right. She wasn't really involved with the studio, no. to my understanding, but certainly she was a sister. Um, but the five brothers were. And Charlie was interesting because he was an inventor, too. You know that machine, like the, it's called a claw digger? Yes. Where you've got a bunch of prizes and you try to move a claw that will pick, pick up the prize. It's, um, yeah. He invented that. He invented that. <laughs> so then, yeah, a lot of inventor, inventors in the family. And family lore has it that um, one day he was asked, well, what happens if the, if the claw actually does capture the prize? And he said, <laughs> we go right out there and fix it. <laughs> <laughs> right in our local mall, there's one of those machines, and I've never seen anybody win yet. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I've seen them, too. And some of them have Betty Boop uh, dolls in them. Oh, sure. Well, that is my uh, my niece, Jessica. She has a big question. She was a huge Betty Boop uh, fanatic and has mentioned that, that she sees she sees Betty Boop everywhere, and she was concerned that a lot of it might even be, you know, bootlegged. Or How, how do you keep track of it all? In fact, I was in... Uh, I was down in, in Orlando and saw, um, I think it was at Universal Studios. There was a whole store for Bet- Betty Boop. Yes. Yes. Now that's got to be very, bonafide, very popular, right? obviously. Yeah. Yes. Well, the, the character is protected under two types of laws. One is copyright and the other is trademark. Right. And uh, copyright protects the expression of ideas. Mm-hmm. And so it would protect the use of Betty Boop in a movie, TV series, a book, um, uh, a musical, a play, or anything like that. Um, trademark protects her image on merchandise. And that's what you see in all those products out there uh, where you see Betty Boop on the, on the Nike uh, shoes or you see her on a doll or a T-shirt. Sure. Uh, trademark protects that. Mm-hmm. And uh, the copyright is still uh, in effect and protecting uh, that side of it, the copyright side of it. And the trademarks are all in effect and protecting that. Um and yeah, there are people who go out and infringe those. And uh, on the trademark side, there are actually companies that follow uh, those who seek out the or unauthorized use. And that's and, uh, that's your job. That's also, what you do. We, we ha- right. Well, that's our job then to enforce it. Right. Um, we work through an agent uh, so that, you know, the actual going out and getting licensees to put Betty Boop on their products. We work through an agent, King Features Syndicate. Yes, I've seen that for a long time. Okay, Uh, about forty-seven years has been this current relationship. It's it's interesting because when Betty Boop became such a star in the thirties, Max went out and found an agent to represent uh, her in merchandise, and it was the same company. Uh, King Features. Inter- oh, all the way back then? Wow. And King Features is a uh, division of the Hearst Corporation. Oh, interesting. Which is another family-owned business. The more I read his biography or, or read anything about this whole whole family, I realize, you know, he started out in the creative side, and he became so involved in business dealings and bankruptcies, not, not necessarily with your company, but I mean bankruptcies with Paramount Studios, and he had to... You know, it must have been an incredible, uh, incredible journey for him to go through this in the business sense. It, it, you know, I'm just lucky, well, it, lucky it, that he was, was a business person as well, right? Because a lot of artists, well, artists aren't. Yeah. <laughs> well, Max wasn't the greatest businessman, I think. No, um, he was kind of forced into a into a, a business role, partially. Um, but, you know, I mean, Dave was became the director of, of the Betty Boop and the Popeye cartoons. Max was the producer and ran the studio and kind of had to 
the business, but at its heart, he was an inventor right. and an artist. And uh, when they moved their studio to Miami in 1940, somebody offered to sell Max uh, Miami Beach for a very, very small amount of money. <laughs> wow. And his response was, what would I do with all that sand? <laughs> uh, it would turn to well, gold. I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. You'd be reaching me on Fleischer Island. If you <laughs> <had> that. <laughs> That's um, right. That's some but, story. Uh, wow. Still, uh, he managed to create this um, character that has uh, endured for so many years and is so popular today and still, you know, still going. And, uh, merchandising is very, very strong. Uh, we have a Broadway musical in development, which we hope will um, open fairly soon. Oh, that's, and, that's uh, exciting. Oh, my God. Who is, who's going to play Betty Boop? Yes. Who would play Betty Boop? <laughs> oh, you we can't tell. I don't know yet. It, oh. It's still in development, so we don't really have it fully um, developed. But uh, we have actually the book, which is what the music world calls, or the musical world calls the script, Mm -hmm. uh, is coming together very nicely with a really talented writer on it. And uh, Bill Haber is producing it, and uh, uh, Jerry Mitchell uh, is uh, directing, and uh, Susan Birkenhead is writing the lyrics. And uh, a beautiful, beautiful world-class score has already been written by David Foster. By David Foster? So, oh, boy. Uh, Yes. Oh, wow. So, you, you, you went uh, for the best. Uh, yes. And, 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 you know, it's not like, gee, the David Foster is capable of writing a world-class, beautiful uh, score for it. He's already done it. It's right. just unbelievable. Jeez. So we're really, there's a very, it's very exciting about this, this upcoming Now, we, we talk about... You're listening to a very self-serving version of my podcast called Top Talent with members of my own family, incredible inventors, incredible animators, the Fleischers, with my very special guest, a grandson of Max Fleischer, Mr. Mark Fleischer. And let's go back to our interview. Top Talent! We talk a lot about Betty Boop, but uh, the guy with the pipe, the sailor guy, we really didn't talk about too much. Now, they didn't invent Popeye himself. Popeye was... A newspaper uh, character, right? In, in a cartoon strip, in, in a newspaper, right? He was a, yeah, he was a comic strip character comic strip. created in, in about 1919 uh, by L.C. Seeger. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's interesting because Popeye did not, it was called Thimble Theater, and it featured Ham Gravy and his girlfriend, Olive Oil, <laughs> <laughs> and, and her brother, Brother Castor Oil. <laughs> really? Um, yeah. I, I, <laughs> really? <honestly. laughs> um, and w w what happened there is that um, it, they had a mythical hen, a whistle hen, they called it, that if you stroked its feathers, it would bring you luck. And Popeye didn't make an appearance in the comic strip for 10 years after it was created. Huh. And the storyline, which is really interesting, is that um, Ham Gravy and uh, Olive Oil, and I think Castor Oil, decided that <laughs> they would go to a casino and bring their whistle hen with them and stroke the hen and get luck and win a lot of money. Get luck. And, and so the casino was located on an island. So they went to the shore and they needed to hire a sailor to take them to the casino. And Popeye was born. That's how he's born. Wow. And that, I know it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and Popeye, there was like whatever sort of dramatic arc that particular storyline was around came to an end. And then Popeye was out of the series, the comic strip. And there was such a public outcry that they put Popeye back in, and he became... He became the star of the series. So it was almost like a uh, spinoff. That was owned by King Features, Hearst Entertainment. Oh. And I think Hearst approached Max and said, would you like to do a animated series, a series of cartoons uh, of Popeye? And Max loved Popeye. He huh. said, God, that would be just great. Uh, and it was, again... Because uh, Max had this relationship with Paramount that financed and distributed 
his cartoons, principally the Betty Boop cartoons, uh, they turned to Paramount to uh, also uh, finance and distribute, distribute the Popeye cartoons. And they did a test, like today, you know, when you have a TV series and you want to see if a new character, you could base a series on a new character, you would test the right. character in an episode mm -hmm. of the series. So they introduced Popeye in a Betty Boop cartoon. Popeye no Disney. kidding. That's how it started? Wow. That's how it started. But before they did that, Max looked at it and said, you know, this is kind of weird having Popeye stroke the head of a hen. <laughs> Right. to get luck, and he decided, instead of doing that, let's have Popeye eat spinach, and it brings him strength. So he gave Popeye spinach. Look at that. That's another thing they came up with. Amazing. <laughs> that amazing? is amazing. I did not know and, that one. And, and, and Popeye tested off of the charts for them, so they immediately launched a series, a Popeye series, which became, of course, hugely successful now were they responsible uh, for the i'm sorry go ahead go ahead are they responsible also for the theme did they have anything to do with the, the i'm popeye the sailor man yes that was written for the series it was written for it i just wonder if they had any creative input i'm strong to the finish because i eat me spinach that well obviously since yes, that, yeah that would yeah. all be the creation of of fleischer studios yeah. and its and its people wow another thing i didn't even think about the yeah. theme and there's another interesting piece of this, and that is in the comic strip, again, uh, Max in the studio did not create Superman, although they did one of the most innovative, interesting uh, uh, animated series based on Superman. But in the uh, comic strip series, Superman didn't fly. He, he leaped. <laughs> he was able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Right, right. And again, it was Max who said they did a test of Superman leaping, and they said that looks silly. Let's 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 make him fly. Get out of here! They came up with that. So they, they gave <laughs> Superman flight. <laughs> did they come up with um, faster than a speeding bullet and all that as well? I've... I no, I think that was in the original comic strip. Oh, the original comic strip. Look at all the things they were all yeah. the behind the scenes things that they came up with. Uh, yeah, it just was wonderful. So it was a wonderful group of, you know, people, brothers, animators. Uh, they employed women for the first time. Uh, they were very, very progressive. And there was a question about um, Disney. Yes, that's... that's. And was it? Yep. I, actually, that's part of my uh, my little true-false quiz here. These are things, and now I have to scratch them off because you've mentioned a few of them, but these are things I was always, and my brother and I were always told as a child and just wanted to make sure if they are true or false. The crane in the mall, we already covered that, so i got to check that off. They, they, they invented that. How about the bicycle built for two? I don't think so. No? I mean, okay. I, don't, I don't know that it's, I've never heard that. No? Let me put it that way. I don't know why. That's always stuck in my mind that they did that. Uh, let's see. The eyelet on the dress, we talked about that. The rotoscope. Did they invent the actual name rotoscope? Yes. No, they had to if they, did, if they came up with the invention, right? Um, right. Here's another As thing. As a matter of fact, Go ahead. I, have the, I have the original drawings that Max did that were submitted to the patent office. That's got to be fascinating to look at. How, yeah. how about this one? Did Disney ever work for Max Fleischer? No. No, he didn't? Okay. Uh, he never worked. And it, it, there's a really interesting story here, um, and that is that Disney and Max were really bitter competitors. Right, sure. Uh, and there was a, a lot of bad blood between them. And Max, who was this really gentle, sweet, loving man, if you said Disney, he'd become apoplectic. <laughs> <laughs> really? Um huh. And after uh, my after Max's studio went out of business, my father became a director and moved to Hollywood. Which is yes, and he was directing B movies for uh, RKO, mm -hmm. and was really building a name for himself. And one day he was in his office, and the phone rang, and he picked it up, and it was Walt Disney. And Disney said, "Would you come to my studio tomorrow?" My father said, "Of course." And he went to Disney's office, and he had all of these uh, models of the Nautilus and drawings on 
the, you know, on the walls and everything uh, and storyboards. And Disney said to my dad, did you ever read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea? And my father said, yes, of course, I've always loved it. And Disney said, well, we're going to make our first ever completely live action movie based on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It'll be the most expensive movie ever made. And if it's a failure, the studio will go bankrupt. Would you like to direct it? My father was just floored. And he yeah. said, do you know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and Disney said, yeah, he said, you're Max's son. And my father said, I would love to direct your movie, but I need to call my father and ask his permission. Wow. Because I don't, I don't want to appear disloyal. Right. Family. So I wonder what that conversation was and like. And <laughs> Disney said, that's exactly the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, call, you know, call your father and let me know tomorrow if you direct my movie. So my father went home and put through a call to New York. They had to do that in those days. And he told Max about this. And Max, of course, said, you know, are you crazy? Of course you direct his movie. <laughs> I mean, this is your big chance to break into A-level movies. Sure. And you tell Walt Disney one thing. And my dad said, what's that? And Max said, tell Disney he has great taste in directing. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> my dad went and 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 directed the movie and it was a smash success it was really great disney became a family friend no kidding in those days oh, I, I grew up knowing him as uncle walt you really knew him um, oh man oh yeah oh wow you you know those those uh photographs of him he had like a, a miniature train in his backyard and yeah him, you know as the conductor with the hat you know, i sat on that train right behind him <laughs> do you have any uh, photos of this so did my brother i don't think so oh my, my brother too his sister was too young um but one day disney and my father were on the phone and my father happened to mention that his father was coming to los angeles uh, for to celebrate an anniversary, which is about 1954. And Disney said, I want you to extend an invitation to your father to come to my studio where I will host a reunion with all of his former anim animators that we used to work for Fleischer Studios that are now working for me. Oh, that's and a nice gesture. My grandfather accepted the, uh, the offer, and he went out to the studio and the two men reconciled, and they became friends for the rest of their lives. That's great. It always made it sound like it was a really uh, cantankerous relationship. It, w it was yeah. while my grandfather was in business. Right. Um, and then Disney reached out to him, and uh, you know, when Disney would come to New York, he'd pay a call on Max. I, it's, I think, a really lovely Hollywood story. And the other uh, Fleischer true or false question I have, was it true that Fleischer Studios at one point was the biggest employer in the state of Florida? I believe that that was true because Miami was really not a uh, you know developed place right. uh, like it is today. I and mean, it was trying to make a name for itself. So the city uh, elders uh, really tried to make coming to uh, building the studio in Miami as attractive as possible. And... They built it very, very quickly, uh, the studio. It was the first fully commercial air-conditioned uh, building in Florida. Interesting. Um, and, uh, again, a question was asked, you know, what is it today? It's run by the government as a children's services company. And is and, a lot of it uh, still intact from the original, or is it, is it completely unrecognizable? Well, no, no, most of it is intact. In fact, wow. um, Miami did a Fleischer Studios day at one point, and I didn't know about it until it was too late. Um, so they asked me to come out um, to Florida to accept the keys to the, uh, to the county, and they held the ceremony at Fleischer Studios uh, in the Children's Services Center. And they walked me through it and it was fascinating because what was is now a gym used to be the theater and you could see where the projectors used to be up on the wall huh. uh and uh, it was really nice and i of course told them how generous they were for giving us the uh, florida keys but um it was uh 
it was a really very touching moment and to, and to see the studio which was just about completely intact was uh, quite a thrill yeah that's great that they kept it intact and is it true that they had like 700 animators like how many people were we talking about I remember exactly yeah I, I don't remember exactly oh, yeah. how many, but it was pretty impressive for its time. Right. And the way they did it, I know we're kind of out of yeah. order here, but they would have like somebody drawing like the main cells, I guess it would be called. And then they had in-betweeners that would draw all the cells in between. Yeah. yeah the, key, the key cells and then the ones that are uh, in between. Um, and they had all kinds of, um, you know, it was very, very complex. And it's, it, it's, it's too bad because there are very few animation cells existing today. But in those days, the practice was when they were finished with an animation cell, they would wash it off and use it again. But that process, the rotoscoping process, isn't that being used in some form today every once in a while? Some, I was reading somewhere. Well, it is. I mean, some form of it. Some form of it, um, yeah. Obviously, it's you know if you're going to do hand drawn animation, you're going to do something like that. Right. And there are people who do do it. Um, there's the group Cupheads, which you know very successful in the games that they've been producing, who openly, uh, basically acknowledge and and say that this is a basically an homage to the Fleischer style. Of and, animation and Ren and Stimpy, um, the Ren and Stimpy show. There was some cartoon show on TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I don't know about yeah. you know whether they do that or not. But, right, uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, I think they they actually pay tribute to him as well. It's fascinating. And again, we could do an entire three podcasts on all the different movies that your father was involved with. <laughs> Between 20,000 Leagues Under the yep. Sea and Fantastic Voyage, I have the whole list here. The Boston Strangler. Yeah. Oh my God, it goes on and on. It's amazing. His his range yeah. was just fantastic. Did you have a chance as a child to uh, to even visit any of these movie studio movie lots? Oh no, that was before your time, though, right? Uh, yes. Oh, you did? No, no, no. Oh no, no they weren't I've before spent your time. Hours and hours and hours on on his sets and locations. Um, when he was shooting the Vikings, huh. uh, my brother and sister and I went. Uh, and spent uh, you know three months in in Norway and then in Germany where they were doing the uh, interiors. And um, my sister was quite young, but my brother and I you know were just like all over the place. And there were um, one other the, the the director of photography's son was there too, Peter Cardiff. And Kirk Douglas uh, one day presented us as a gift. Uh, each one, my brother, Peter, and I. He gave a little Viking costume to, um, <laughs> and each each one was for one of the main stars characters in the movie, and uh, that was quite a thrill running around with uh, uh, with my little sword and and, and shield. <laughs> <laughs> Something you wouldn't wear today. No, it'd be, it'd be a little embarrassing. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, so we spent a lot of time on the. Uh, you know, on the set, I, I worked on a couple of my father's movies when I was older. Really? Um, yeah, I was uh, an associate producer of Tough Enough. And there is one funny story where when I was very small and I was going to go on the set for the first time to watch my father shoot, uh, everyone kept saying to me, now, when your father says action, you have to be quiet. You can't talk. You right. can't say anything. Right. And I, I kind of finally got it. And so I was standing there. And my father said, action. And the actors started to speak. And I went, Shh, you're not supposed to talk. <laughs> well, <laughs> you took it literally. <laughs> That's what he's I told you to do. I, mean, I thought everyone was supposed to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a few other questions I had here. Just uh, You should see the paperwork I have here. I, I think I overstudied for this test. You ever do that where you studied so much <laughs> as a kid that I, I can't remember anything? I think that's, that's what happened exactly. to me. I was, yeah, I was going through panic mode before. This, but um, Betty Boop, going back to Betty Boop, she was so PG, I guess, for her time. Did they use that as to their advantage? Or, uh, the fact that you know she was banned in in several instances, right? Well, Didn't they ban her cartoons? But she wasn't really banned. No, uh, Hayes Commission basically it they they set standards 
Right. They, well, they actually forced the industry to self-regulate and, and set a production code. And um, that production code had to be followed by everybody. And so Betty Boop became much more demure, demure and kind of more like a school teacher than the sort of sexy, uh, sassy uh, character that she was and that made her so uh, popular. But do you think that and, Max kind of like rubbed his hands together thinking, oh boy, I'm getting more publicity out of this? Did, was his thinking along those lines? I doubt it. No? I would think it was pretty crushing. Uh, I think that was why uh, Betty Boop, the later cartoons, the character went out of fashion. Hmm. Uh, the public you know, didn't like that that change. Hmm. I'm thinking yeah. more like today, you know, and any, any publicity is good publicity. Well, I've never believed that, frankly. No. Um, there can be, you know, plenty of examples in today's world where people have been ruined by bad publicity. And, right. and Betty didn't need the publicity. I mean, she was such a star. Um, yeah. There are examples of the uh, movie marquees where, you know, the, the cartoons would proceed the uh, the main attraction, the movie. Right. Um, there right. were movie uh, car- marquees where Betty Boop's name went above the movie. <laughs> wow. That was the major attraction. Wow. She was that popular. Interesting. Well, one other question I'm missing here, kind of a kind of a touchy one, kind of a controversial one in a way. My cousin uh, Steve, that would be Ethel's daughter Paula's son, asked the question: Do you think that they were hampered a little bit by the the anti-Semitism at the time? The studio? Yeah, that that was always something we heard that no. they were kind of held back versus Disney. Well, versus Disney, I I once asked my father. You know, we've all heard rumors that you know Disney was anti-Semitic, right? And my father simply looked at me and said, well, he picked me to direct mm. 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. That's true. And as a family friend, what, what do you think? <laughs> okay. Well, that I answers that. Kind of silly having asked the question. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I've never heard that anti-Semitism was an issue for the studio. It may have been. I, it's just nothing that I've encountered or, or that I was told about. Right, right, right. Because you do wonder... They were the inventors of all this. How come Disney? How come everybody knows about Disney? And, and well, let's let's put it this way: Do you feel that the Fleischer name still is is not as much in the public eye as it should be for everything they've invented and came up with? I, you know, life is life is life, um, and uh, my father always used to say about his father that he's he's the man that the public forgot, um, right. and. You know, Max's name was was very very famous in its day. Um, you know, and it it didn't like well, Max's fortunes were not caused by anti semitism so much as, or not so much. Uh, they weren't caused, to my knowledge, at all by anti semitism. It was a business decision by Paramount to foreclose on uh, his studio which basically put him out of business. Right. Uh, it wasn't Walt Disney's competition or anything like that. No, it wasn't. Okay. And there's lots of people, you know, who uh, speculate about exactly why Paramount did what it did. And my father talks about it in his book, Out of the Inkwell. But the fact is that happened and he was no longer producing cartoons. And the cartoons lived on and the characters have lived on. Um, there was, you know, a period of time when it was, uh, you know, very, very quiet hmm. and Betty, Be- Betty Boop existed only in the old cartoons, which would be playing like on Saturday morning. And that was about it until my father and his sister, Ruth, and their attorney, who was Max's attorney originally, Stanley Handman, uh, went to King Features, said, do you think there's some value here? And the King Feature said yes, and started building a merchandising program around Betty Boop, which is, I always call them the miracle of Betty Boop, because she's one of the very, very few cartoon properties that have uh, achieved this iconic status without having modern entertainment, a production of some sort. That's true. That's very true. Yeah, you don't see kids watching a Betty Boop 
cartoon. That's true. To support all the merchandise. There, there are none. Yeah, not, there are none since the, uh, the original 30s cartoons. And another interesting thing about huh. Betty Boop is she's the only cartoon female superstar that does not have a male counterpart. That's a good point. Well, I thought I read somewhere that there was an animated series that was going to be produced in France aimed at teenagers that was going to start Betty Boop? That was proposed, but that was like 25 years ago. Oh, was that long ago? Okay. Now there was a more recent uh, development uh, of Betty Boop as a CGI uh, series, Mm -hmm. Um, and that didn't happen either. Well, maybe after the Broadway play, maybe there'll be a, a huge resurgence. You never know. You never well, know. I, yeah. Uh, well, there's still a tremendous interest. We get approached a lot by people uh, wanting to do a TV series or a movie or whatever. And we've gone down that road several times in development. Development usually doesn't uh, result in anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and right now, the focus is on the... Uh, the musical, which is really maturing, <laughs> and I have very high hopes that will actually come to pass. Oh, yeah. Can't wait to see that. One more thing. Um, I live, or we live, <clears throat> here in the Albany area, Albany, New York, which is really close to, I don't know if you've ever been here, but uh, close to Saratoga, the Saratoga Racetrack, which is a famous track. And when I was on the radio, I was on morning radio here for years, we did an event at the Saratoga track, and <clears throat> I was walking to where the betting booths are, the betting windows. And I'm walking by, and I'm looking at this guy, and I said, oh, my God, that's Cab Calloway. <laughs> now, maybe before I continue, can you explain Cab Calloway's connection with uh, Max Fleischer? Well, yes. Um, one of the main elements of the original Betty Boop cartoons was music. Right. I like to think of the Betty Boop cartoons as being the first music videos. And... Max did something that was pretty extraordinary for its time. And he, he actually took some of the great music stars of the day and would rotoscope them and have them appear as a cartoon character in Betty Boop movie. The old man of the mountain uh, comes to mind where she goes under the mountain and he's the sort of ghostly, crazy uh, character that turns himself inside out and dances around. And it's just crazy. It's so funny. And I understand that when Cab Calloway first saw that, he was in the editing room with Max and we were sitting on stools looking at it in one of the machines. And he laughed so hard he fell off the stool. <laughs> That's something. So but Cap- it was always a hallmark of the Betty Boop cartoons that there would be a heavy, heavy use of music and of musicians. So I'm looking at him and I said... I- I definitely recognize that face. I think I'm almost positive that's Cab Calloway. So I walked over to him and I said, uh, Mr. Calloway, and he looked right at me and I said, I just want to let you know I'm distantly related to Max Fleischer. And he looked at me and it was just like a blank, like a blank stare. I don't know whether his hearing was bad or it's very loud in that room or I don't know what it was, but there was just absolutely no response. But I was like two inches from his face. I definitely know that was Cab Calloway. Sure. Yeah. So oh, he's a legend. Yeah, he was a legend. Well, so are you, and so is your whole family. And I was just <laughs> so happy to do this. And I'm our doing, our family. <laughs> our family, yes, our family, yes. And uh, I I really thank you for spending all the time. I hope hope we got all the information out. I was I was sweating this because to tell this story in chronological order could be an, a nine hour podcast. <laughs> but I would have loved it. It's a, it's a real pleasure, Richie. And if there's any further things you want to do or talk about, uh, I'm available. Just give me a call and we can, you know, launch into more of this or other subjects. Oh, that'd be yeah. great. Oh, thank you so much for your time. And I want to thank uh, Ginny Mahoney for connecting me, like I mentioned before. That's about it. Thank you so much for being part of this. Well, thank you. I really, really, really enjoyed it. I really hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. I had just such a blast reconnecting. And I want to dedicate this podcast to all my family members who are branches of this huge tree. You, The rest of you can shut this off if you want to. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to want to listen to all of this. I'm never going to get to all the people in the family. But they include Ethel, 
Max Fleischer's sister, and Ben Phillips, my grandparents. Their three kids and spouses, Morton and Rosalind Phillips, that's my parents, uh, Larry and Phyllis Phillips, that's an aunt and uncle, Paula and Maurice Side, that's an aunt and uncle, then their kids and spouses, which are Richie and Dory Phillips, yours truly, Bill and Karen Phillips, my brother, Diane and Dr. Mark Stenklick, Nancy and Merrick Gottlieb, and Dr. Paul Phillips, and also we have Steve and Susan Side, and Arlene and George Nelson. Again, these are the kids of the people that I mentioned above. And to the many kids of those kids, which I'm not going to have a chance to mention, their spouses and their kids. Oh my God, what did I get myself into? Thanks again to my brother, Bill Phillips, our son, Ben Phillips, niece, Jessica Lorenz, and nephew, Tyler Phillips, and cousin, Steve Side, for contributing questions. I know my nephew, Matt Phillips, would have but he's in the weeds covering the stock market debacle uh, due to the coronavirus that we are now uh, going through. And maybe if you listen to this from a year from now, I'm praying that it'll be a distant memory. Thank you again for listening to the podcast, and I will see you in the next episode. You can help with the guests and all the rest, and we'll never stop till we take it to the top. To the top, not the bottom of the top, top talent.